So if, uh, first of all, I want to thanks uh, Carlos for, for the invitation when when uh, one of our partners called to to give some talks. Uh, the idea was to give one talk of all tumors in the upper limb it was a very big so that that's why we split in two. And the idea is to give a, a very short uh, report so, so that you can see what are the tumors that you can expect in the upper limb and to, to see images and, and to, to try to introduce in, in this very, for us, it's very passionate to, to work with this, but also in, in benign tumors, there are very uh, few numbers because mainly we, we saw malignant tumors. So, so we're going to, to begin the talk. How about going? It's okay. That's my, my disclosure. I'm uh, I'm of the editorial board of the core. So, what 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 we know of benign bone soft tissue of the upper extremity are less frequent than in the lower limb, like three to seven. So that, that's or two to eight. They're very infrequent. They're usually discovered incidentally during the evaluation of a trauma or a common lesion, but it's very important to understand the differential diagnosis, the workup and the treatment for upper extremity. It's okay, the screen for you? So first we're going to give you a general in, uh, uh, indications. Here you, you can see the benign bone tumors and mainly uh, they, are, they are classified according to which cell they produce tumor. So here it's very small for bone tumors. So it, if it, the bone tumors, uh, benign bone tumors, osteostoma, osteoblastoma, the cartilage are the enchondroma, the peristal chondroma, the osteochondroma, chondroblastoma. We are not going to talk of chondromyxoid fibroma because it's very strange in the upper extremities, mainly in the lower limb. Other tumor that is very frequent, we're going to just say a few words. It's a non ossifying fibroma. It's very frequent in child, but it's very extremely rare in the upper limb. And some unknown, like the giant cell tumor or the aneurysmal bone cyst, it used to be a pseudo tumor, but now there's translocation, so it's a benign tumor. And then we're going to speak of other, like a unicameral bone cysts and others. How, how we classify the benign bone tumors, mainly we use the anakin classification that is uh, inactive latent lesions, just as the non ossifying fibroma or the inchondroma except in the hand. The actives so that are giant cell tumor, ABC, chondroblastoma, chondromic cell fibroma, osteoblastoma, that we have to perform surgery and the aggressive that for sure we have risk of local recurrence like the giant cell tumor and arrhythmia bone cyst. This is just a picture to show how a latent tumor, we don't perform anything. The active, we try to re perform uh, intralitional and in the very aggressive, we try to perform resection. So when we speak of b bone tumors, here it's, you, you can see that it's very, there are more tumors because the, it, it could be for fibrous like the nodular fasciitis, elastofibroma, fibrous tissitic cells like the fibrous tissitoma, from le, the lipomas, smooth muscle like the lyomyoma, skeletal muscle, rhabdomyoma, blood vessel, so whatever cell you, you can imagine here, you, you can have a, a benign tumor. So we're going to talk of the most frequent in the upper limb and some to some cell tumors that you can see in the normal clinics that they could mimic a tumor. And sometimes the, there is a mixed diagnosis that you, they could have a, a problem for the patient, like the myositis ossificans, that is very, many of that type of lesions, they, even they perform, they, they give chemotherapy because of the misdiagnosis. So the, what, what is the patient evaluation? As usual, it's symptoms are very important. Pain is important. You can have a night pain in the osteoblastoma, osteoblastoma, rate of growth. The rate of growth, it could be a malignant tumor, but it's also in, in a tumor that grows and, and goes down and goes up. It could be an amangioma. 
the presence of a mass, the family history for neurofibromatosis, osteochondromatosis, very important. Usually the physical examination, like a mass or the range of motion. And it's very important when you have a fracture, you have to question the patient how, how it was. It was with no trauma. Uh, it, it's, it's very common that in the, in the emergency room, they don't ask how, how was the fracture. Uh, so it's very important to ask if he was sitting down and he had the fracture, perhaps. So you, you have to ask how the fracture was performed. And imagine we're going to see how the, we use radiograph. We always perform radiograph. It's very important for, for oncology, uh, the radiograph. It gives a lot of information, ultrasound, obviously the bone scans, the CT and the magnetic the MRI is very important, but it, you never have to forget the radiographs. So how, how we perform the, the diagnosis, the biopsy is, is the, the thing that gives the diagnosis. So, so the, the gold standard is the core needle because the core needle gives tissue. The fine needle, it could be cells, but it's not very good for us. So core needle is the, the best choice. The open incision biopsy is, it should be small. You can see there in the picture how it's, it's an elbow. They perform the, the incisional biopsy. It, it always have to be vertical or longitudinal, never transparent like that. It, it's going to have a, a big resection if it's malignant. And the excisional biopsy, because we're speaking about benign tumor, is only indicated when the surgeon is sure that the lesion is benign or when you can take the tumor with a wide margin. If you can take it with a wide margin, you can perform excision biopsy. But you usually have to have some kind of image. It's, we, if you are going to perform an excision biopsy, we, we prefer an MRI previously. So that's, but you, remember the core needle is very important for us. So we, when we speak about treatment, you, we, we know that surgical margins are designed to reduce the risk of local recurrence. That, that's why we classify the margins in intralesional. That's very common in benign tumor because the plane of the section in, enters in the tumor. It's not a problem. Marginal when the plane of the section is through the reactive zone of the edge of tumor, but you can leave some microscopic disease. So these are mainly what we use in benign tumor or intralesional margin. We're going to speak about that. And then it's the wide and the when the tumor is removed with the with calf of normal tissue and the radical that is not only an amputation, it could be a, a resection of the whole compartment, but it's not used here, except some strange cases that we're going to notice when, when we, we speak about the specific tumor. But mainly benign tumor, we use interlation and marginal and in some aggressive wide resections. So when we speak speak about specifically benign bone tumors, we, we can perform observation in inactive lesions, uh, like I show you in the number one. In some cases, you could perform aspiration and injection like the UBC. Uh, you can put corticoids, bone marrow, synthetic bone graft, but really the corticoid, the corticoids, the metabolic prednisolone, it really works in the UBC. I'm going to show you some cases. And in the eosinophilic granuloma or the Langerhans histocytosis, the injection of cortical or just the, the biopsy, it, it could perform the healing of the, of the lesion. So then we have the curatage that we can perform. It's interlesional. We can perform in giant cell tumor, chondroblastoma, chondromixed fibroma, osteoblastoma. You can see ABC, UBC, and chondroma. And usually you, you, you have to perform the curatage is, is, is a remark that you have to have some local neoadjuvant, but we're going to show you a picture. And the resection that it could be without reconstruction, just like osteochondroma or with reconstruction, like the giant cell tube. So this is a very interesting article about local adjuvant substances following curatage of bone tumor. And you can see that we don't have any strong evidence that it works. So, so we, every center perform it, but is the most important thing is a, a good curatage and a, but for tumor control. So we don't have any, the all articles are of poor quality. So really you cannot, you cannot, you know, you know, 
believe that the local adjuvant is going to cure the bone tumor. You, you need to be really a very extensive curators. The curators is, is, is the fundamental for the treatment of this tumor. So when we spoke about benign soft tissue tumors, you can have observation like lipomas, just watch them. Simple excision like lipomas, you, you can perform intralitional marginal or myxomas or schwannomas. And it's a, a tumor that you need to perform wide resection that is a desmoid tumors. Really, is the worst. It's like the chewing gum. It's never, you have to take it all. It's, it's very, the risk of local recurrence is very high. So now we're going to, to speak specifically of, about some of the, the, the bone tumors and the soft tissue benign tumors and how we can observe and how, what we're going to see in the upper extremity. So here I put the bone benign tumors in the osteosteoma, osteoblastoma. For the pathologies, the osteosteoma, osteoblastoma is similar histopathologically, but the osteosteoma is less than 1.5 centimeters and the osteoblastoma is bigger. But that the main difference is the osteoblastoma it's, uh, it's not going to grow, it's, go, it, 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 it's just one centimeter. The osteoblastoma is more aggressive, you have to take it out. I'm going to show you some pictures. And you can see here that the, you, you, you have here in, in, the, in the finger, you can see a very the tiny, the tumor is really that tiny thing, and then it's all sclerotic. You can see in the fingers, it's a round wall intercortical lesion with with the needles, you have to take the needles. It's very, here you can see in the, in the CT scan, if you have any doubt, if you have pain and you, you don't have, you don't know where, where you, you can, the bone scan is very useful for osteostoma, osteoblastoma. And nowadays we don't perform resection only in hand because in most places we, have, we, we use radiofrequency ablation. But the problem in the hand, because it burns, it could burn the skin. We have some cases in the tibia or, or, or in the spine that it could burn in the spine, the, the, you know, the nerves. And, and, and if the tumor is very superficial, you can burn it. So in the finger, it's not, we, we try to re perform resection specifically in the finger. So, but in some cases like this is an osteoblastoma, you can see it's, it's a, here, in the distal humerus. So in this case, because it's quite big, you, you can see the bone scan. We perform a resection and we put an agraph and you can see this uh, X-ray five years after the reconstruction. So it, it, we perform big reconstruction, but I, I, I told you that the osteoblastoma could grow. So you can see very huge. This is an osteoblastoma. It's a very big osteoblastoma, a lot of ears. The, you, you can see it could grow. So, so the osteoblastoma, you can, you can take it out. The osteoblastoma, if the patient wants to just drink a aspirin, we have some patients that don't want surgery and they just drink the aspirin. It, it shows in some papers that after some years, it could, the pain could go out and that's it. Uh, usually we perform rather frequency. So now we're going to speak of cartilage tumor. Cartilage tumor depends of the which type of cartilage is the origin of tumor. We have the enchondroma. This is very famous in hand and very famous in upper extremity. It's a benign tumor, but it's of mature yelling cartilage. So it's mainly in intramedullary. It's usually between 20 and 50 years, but usually we have a difference between all the bones and the bones of the fingers of the foot and the hand. So. If you see this picture of the bone here, and you, if, if you see it here in the hand, it's more aggressive. So if you have this, this cortical erosion in the humerus or in the radius or in the ulna, it's going to be a chondrosarcoma, but in the, in the fingers, usually it's, an, it's a benign chondroma. And it's the most common bone tumor in the hand. The end chondroma, the most frequent, it's very rare that you, we have all in our series only three chondrosarcomas in the hand. It's very rare. And it's very frequent in proximal humans. And what is the characteristic that you know that is benign in the long bones, except in the hand, that the lesion never have erosion of the cortical here. You can see 
we're not going to perform any biopsy in these cases because it's really far away from the cortical, no erosion, no pain. Usually it's asymptomatic. It's different in the hand because it tends to grow. And it, so this is a case to show you to a pathological fracture. You have erosion here. You have a, a big mass here, erosion. They put a nail and you can see the big mass after three months of the nail. So if you have erosion, uh, some here, these, these lytic lesions here, you, you have to suspect a conosocoma. Just to show you, be aware of these lesions. It's not the same in the fingers. In the fingers, it's going to be 99% or more, it's going to be an achondroma. So you have the earlier diseases, the multiple achondromatosis. Usually we don't, we try to perform only uh, surgery when you have some uh, problems in maturity or, or an alignment, but we don't resect these lesions just to control them. And this earlier disease and the Mafuchi disease, that's, Mafuchi is the same and chondromatosis, but with hemangiomas, there are high risk of chondrosarcomas when they're over 40. So you have to be very careful of the hip, the shoulder, the, the or usually the chondromas near the proximal uh, part of the limbs could grow to a chondrosarcoma. So you just control, you can see the lesions here. You just control if the growth is okay, no malignant. So here is to show you, uh, how we just perform a cure attach. You can see some, some pictures. You can see how we perform an open cure attach here. And here you can see an enchondroma two years after surgery. It, you, you see here, here is the lesion, and this is after five years, it's, it's okay. Usually they never, there are never local recurrence. You can use bone graft, iliac crest, whatever. But we try to perform uh, a cure attach. No local adjuvants. No local adjuvants is good for cartilage lesions because they grow very slow. This is a very, it's a cartilage tumor. It's very strange. It's, it's a chondroma, but it grows in the periosteum. But it's very common in proximal rumors. It's very uncommon in the lower limb. So, here you can see the, it's only here cartilage is it grows in the in the cortex. Usually you treat symptomatic patients if it's a, if they have some symptoms, but we just take the cartilage of the surface of the bone. Here you can see you can see this this X-ray, uh, but here you can see the cartilage in the MRI. How you see all it's over the corticals and here's some reaction. Here, it's, it's very difficult to, to separate this lesion from the parastrosarcoma, but in this case, it's, you have cartilage over, like a cap, like a hat over the bone, but it's very typical of the proximal liver. So you have to be aware of the periosteostrosarcoma, you know, uh, and chondroma. And here we have the osteochondroma. We, we were uh, talking about cartilage, and the enchondroma and periosteochondroma was yalin cartilage. This osteochondroma is, is a benign tumor that it uh, depends of the fissure of, of the cartilage of the, uh, the growing physis. And to understand is the, the growing physis, there's some trauma or something that makes to make a, a, another bone. You can see here, this is an osteochondroma we, we resect. Uh, this is a growing physis and it grows like a tree, but the, you know, the root is not there, it's, it's in, the, in the upper part. It's the most common benign bone tumor. The enchondroma is the most common benign tumor of the hand, but this is the most benign tumor of all over the lab, upper limb, lower limb. Most lesions are symptomatic and are identified when they, they, they're very young. You can see an osteochondroma scapula of the proximal humerus. It could be sessile like this, or pedunculate. The pedunculate is very easy to, to diagnose, but the cecil, it's, you, you, need to, you, you need a CT scan. And we only treat patients that are uh, symptomatic. So what's the main difference? We perform biopsy on osteochondroma. We never perform biopsy. The, how we make the diagnosis with a CT scan. Look here in the left, is an osteochondroma. The cancellous bone of the osteochondroma 
is continuous with the cancerous bone of the bone. And this is a parastial astro astrosarcoma. There is a growing in the cortical, but there is no cancellus that is continued with the cancellus of the diaphysis. So this is the difference between the parastial osteosarcoma, a malignant tumor, and the an osteochondroma. And even the, if you remember the, the other slide of periosteal enchondroma, there is cartilage over. So you, you, you can diagnose this with the CT scan. So remember the osteochondroma, we never perform biopsy. We just uh, ask for a CT if the cancellous bone of the osteochondroma is continuous with the cancellous bone of the humerus or whatever bone is, is an osteochondroma. So we just control them. Obviously, there is a, a osteochondromatosis that is multiple osteochondromas. And in these cases, 80% is autosomical dominant. So there's a family history. So again, we treat symptomatic with never or some malalignment. Uh, for example, in this case, the, the patient was not able to make adduction because here you see the osteochondroma on the chest wall. So we just resect, that's all. We, but we don't treat all the osteochondromas of the humerus, only the symptomatic. And it could be some, uh, the, some of these osteochondromas, all like the onchondromatosis, could transform to a, a chondrosarcoma, but mainly in the proximal humerus and the scapula, never distally. So you have to control the proximal ones. And we continue with the cartilage. You're quite bored, you know, all, all cartilage cartilage, but the cartilage are different. And, and this is the benign tumor. It's, uh, from, it's, it's different from the giant cell tumor in the X-ray. This cartilage is for the ossification centers. So that's why we found it in the epiphysis and apophysis. And you can see it's one of the so chondrostoma giant cell tumor are mainly in the epiphysis. You can see are very young patients. It's very common in proximal humerus. And in some cases, it could develop to a, a pulmonary metastasis. Uh, that's why in the new classification of tumors, they are putting benign tumors, malignant tumor, and this tumor intermediate that we don't know where to put them because they are benign, but they have a, they could perform a benign meds, but it's just control the meds, nothing, not, nothing more. I, I told you it could be in the epiphysis and the apophysis. It's very common that they cross the growing plate. So this is very common of the chondroblastoma. And we perform curatage, local adjuvants, and, and bone grafting or whatever. But be aware because in this, in the in the uh, proximal humus, in the head, it could perform to a head necrosis. We have we have some not not in the proximal humor, but in the in the proximal femur, we have a, a lot of patients with osteonecrosis. You have to be aware of that. And in some cases, it could be very destructive. This patient, it, it's two months to grow at this size. And in some cases, we have to resect it. So uh, it's a very aggressive tumor. Uh, it's, it could grow. So you, you have to perform, in some cases, a resection. Just to mention, no nocified fibroma is very rare. It's a, a, an exotic lesion. Uh, it's a, the, the, there's a sclerotic rim. It's not an airplasm, really. It's a failure of education. It's just you know that because no nocified fibroma is very common in the lower limb. The, there are some papers that say that 30% of the children could have one, but it's very strange in the upper extremity. In the lower limb, we never biopsy. They're very frequent, very typical. In the upper extremity, we always biopsy because they're very strange and we have to have a, a diagnosis. But it's just to show you, it's, there's a sclerotic rim, it's in the cortical. Uh, we, it's very rare that we perform curative bone grafting. We just control and that's it. It's just to mention to, to you know, the tumor. There are some, other tumors like the fibrous dysplasia, this like a cellular tumor, is a intermediary proliferation of fibrous tissue. You can see this polystatic disease, uh, mainly our younger patients. Uh, this is a very strange case. It's very, you, you have a monostatic and polystatic. Uh, I'm showing these pictures, polystatic, that you see big 
tumors like this, but you're going to see a lot of bones affected. There are some syndromes, like the McCune Albert syndrome, that there's polyostatic fibrous dysplasia, some endocrine problems, and pigmented skin lesions. It's very strange. And more strange is the muscle brow syndrome, that is, in this case, fibrous dysplasia at the hand of other bones and a myxoma. Really, it's very strange. But if, if you have a fibrous dysplasia and a myxoma, you, you, you can publish. It's, it's a strange case. But mainly, uh, you can be, you can, See these cases, this uh, central clitic lesion. This is full of uh, fibrous uh, type of tumor. So uh, he, you can see here in the radius, it's, it's a, we call the ground glass or shower door glass appearance. And we treat deformities. Uh, although you can perform a cure test. If you perform a cure test, don't put bone graft, put a cortical because it's going to reabsorb. It's like the, the bone, there it's going to perform the fibrous dysplasia again. So if we have to have surgery because it's a risk of fracture, we, we put a cortical of allograft there so that it gives time and there's no resorption. Really, we, we put that like struts there, no, never bone graft is going to grow again a fibrous dysplasia. Then it, you have the Langer's hand cell histocytosis, very strange, uh, but 80% are, are younger patients. It's a, the most common is a solitary disease. There's a multiple bone site disease, but this, they should perform chemo. And uh, you can see here when there's a B-cell involvement, this very poor prognosis is available of 50% at five years, but the problem is not bone, is the affection of the B-cell involvement. You can perform bone graft, but really, if you have a solitary disease, I could, I, I'm going to show you, you with just the biopsy, while you are waiting the biopsy, it heals. It's very, you're going to find a lot of papers. You can have, you, you can put methyl prednisolona, the needle biopsy make them heal. This is typically a central lesion. And this is very typical, it's not apple limb, but the vertebral plan is very typical of the histiocytosis. And this is a case. We, we have this, this was not so centrical. We performed the biopsy. This, this was two months when the pathologist called us and, and said, I, I believe this is a, a longer hand disease. Uh, it, it had already healed. So, so always ask for a second uh, x-ray. You, you, you need them because you, you're going to be in diagnosis with the x-ray. So it's okay because sometimes the biopsy is not enough. But if you ask, uh, another x-ray, the pathologist is not so sure, and it heals, sure if it was a, it's just, it does it's X or longer hand disease. So now we have cystic lesions. Uh, uh, There's a main difference because although we, we, we saw in the, in the x-ray that we, have, we, we saw lytic lesions, these are really cyst, cystic lesions with liquid. And why is the difference? Because this, uh, you can make diagnosis with the fracture because why it, here, these little lesions that are centrally like the Langerhans disease or like the fibrous dysplasia, most patients younger is the same, proximal limb is the same. But when you have a fracture because the liquid goes away of the bone, you have like here, you can see here, it's the fallen leaf. You see fragments of bone that goes down because it's empty, That's, it's, it's pathognomonic of the UBC. So the only evidence-based treatment, you can put whatever you want. You can put bone marrow, uh, allograft, whatever. But the only evidence-based treatment is the intralacial injection of methylprednisolona. So you can see here, we two, two, put two needles, one to make the compression, and then we put the methylprednisolone. And I'm going to show you some pictures you, you can see here, there is a big, how, how, it's not one injection. You have to perform more than one. Even some fractures, when it heals the, the unicamal bones, it heals. And, and you can see here how it, it could take one year, but you have to be patient. You, you have to be patient and, and the parents must be more patient. But sometimes they want to have fast surgery. And believe me, this is a case that it was a cure test, and you can see here, like 10, eight months, the, the cyst was a, again. Again, you, you can see it's the same after the cure test. So it's, sometimes 
when you perform curettage and it doesn't work, put some methylprednisolone and it's going to work. You, you have to put so something we, we spoke with the patients is prefer to wait uh, put metal person on because the bone grafting is not always work some cases like this case it, it have a, a, a particular fracture but here is a rather narrow it, it, with the fracture was a radial palsy so we have to perform the surgery and, and this is a one year surgery a one year x-ray and it works okay but in this case because we we perform an open surgery because the, of the Palsy of the retinal nerve. Uh, and then we made the discompression was okay. This is an aneurysmal bone cyst. It's the only thing that they have in common is the, 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 the bone cyst, the, the, that two words, because it's totally other, other tumor. Now it's a tumor. The cyst now is a cell tumor, but now the ABC, they found the translocation. It's eccentric. Most patients are younger, like the UBC. It, here in the upper extremities, in the, up, in the proximal humerus, and here, the fluid fluid levels, because you have the liquid of the UBC and you have uh, you have uh, here blood, you can see here, the fluid fluid level here is typically of the ABC. You have to be very aware of, uh, there's an osteoarthritis coma that could lead to that. Uh, so it's very difficult for, even for the biopsy to make the difference between the ABC and the osteoarthritis coma, but you know, if you see this lesion with this fluid, it's okay. It, it, it should be an ABC. So the in this case, you perform curettage and bone grafting and some local adjuvant, but whatever you want. But the most important, the curettage of the lesion. But sometimes you you, ha you don't have a lot of place to curettage, like here. So in some cases, you need to perform a resection. But because they're a very young patient, you give one choice just to perform a curettage and, and if it kills. So, so it's, it's an option. Well, now we have the giant cell tumor bone. We don't know what it is. <laughs> we know this is a bone tumor. Now it's an intermediate tumor. It's not a benign and a malignant. So the, it's a benign aggressive bone tumor that they have a, a difference in mononuclear cells. There are some things that they have for malignant and some things that have for malignant. So that they put in intermediate tumor. 90% are older than 20. So it's mainly more than 20 years. And it's a distal real proximal humerus. Here you can see, look, in, in, the, in the distal radius, it's a very awful tumor. And we, we never know why it's so aggressive in the distal radius, but it's not so only aggressive in the distal radius. We uh, we have, you can have meds here in like the chondroblastoma, but all our pulmonary meds in our series are from, from the wrist. So it's not that all the wrist giant cell tumors have meds, but all our meds are from the from the wrist. So, so it's, it's more aggressive. It's eccentric, it's a lit lytic lesion. It's located in the epiphysis, but could grow to the metaphysis. You can see the epiphysis here. But it is a difference with the chondroblastoma that never is in a sclerotic rim. It's very aggressive. It grows really fast. And if you don't see any sclerotic rim in the in the epiphysis, it's a giant cell tumor. So here you have some meds. Both a different patient. You have a big med. Uh, and the, the surgical treatment is curatized with local adjuvant, but if in, in our series, if we have a, 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 a sorry, if you have a, a tumor in the wrist, we perform resection and reconstruction. We never, we never perform a curatage in the wrist. Uh, some year ago, there was a, we were very happy about the Nosoma. Perhaps someone uh, hear about that. It's an anti rank, well, uh, it's a monoclonal anticorp, anti but it's a problem that. At the beginning, all the people were very happy because we're not going to perform any surgery in these cases, but now the local recurrence are greater than in the normal curatage. This is a patient here with the denosumab, and this is a patient with the denosumab, but it only helps if you want to perform a curatage or resection. Uh, it used in some very 
non-resectable tumors that is not in the upper extremity, mainly the spine and the pelvis. But nowadays, uh, 10, 15 years ago, we were very happy with the nosemal. Now, mostly we just use uh, one or two doses and then we perform surgery. So here you can see metastasis of the lungs is in 1%. But it's very common in in the in the in giant cell tumor in the wrist. Here's a case you can see a big destruction. Here here's the tumor. Here's the radius allograph. Here's the defect, and here's the reconstruction and three years follow up uh, with good function. So we perform in in the wrist. We we perform resection reconstruction. We don't perform curatage. We perform and we don't have good, we, we have a lot of local recurrence. So we finished with the bone tumors. So I hope that you are not tired. We have, we, we, we're going to the benign tumor. So the most common is the lipoma. It's a patient 14, 60, very superficial succaneous lesions are common. Deep lesions are uncommon. Here, Ibernomas are tumors of brown fat and are in younger patients, but usually the Ibernoma you have to, you, ha you have to perform a biopsy because here the lipoma is very typically is uh, with the suppression, it's like the fat, so it's not a problem and it's very common, but we always make diagnosis with the MRI. Like this case, it's very common, it's, it's easy, but in some cases like this, is, this is an Ibernoma, you, you know, here the, the suppression is not the same. So here we perform a biopsy and it was an abnormal, very strange case, but it, you can see them in patients uh, about 40 years. And then we have the hemangioma. The hemangioma is, is, is a very strange tumor because mainly for bone tumors, we, we're going to see in next week when we have a, a tumor that is uh, less than five uh, and superficial, it could be mostly benign. But one of the principles of bone tumors is uh, if, it, if it grows, it's malignant. Except what? The hemangioma, because it grows. And it, it's like, a, we, we see like a raisin, it's, it grows and goes down. It's like a sponge, it grows and goes down because it could grow with the active, with activity. And then it's, so it's very important to us. If, if the tumor, when you're making spores grows and then goes down, you can suspect a uh, vascular neoplasma or malformation. So these are younger than 40 years. Uh, there are several types, the capillary, cavernous, infantile, uh, whatever, is, uh, but are more common, the capillary. Growth is variable. And he, here it's always fluctuates with activity. It's very important to ask patient. You can see calcifications that you can see in, more, in some malignant tumors. But so, so it's very important to, to ask if it fluctuates with activity. And the surgical excision carries a high risk of record recurrence, so we have to control. Uh, so we can perform embolism like this, so to reduce the mass, you can see here big masses. It could be, a, this is typically of an hemangioma. Uh, here is very typical, you can be very, you, you can be very afraid when you see this, but it's it's very typical of a lemon joma. You can see here some big ones, very with a lot of malformation of the skin. And but you you can perform angiography, but the only for to be sure is to ask if it changes when for activity. In some cases like this, we we can perform embolization. It's just to show you. It's just one embolization. You have to perform like every three months to like shrink the tumor, but it, it works. Uh, it's, it's just a very difficult diagnosis because usually sometimes the biopsy is, is not good. So, but you have to have a clinical sus suspicious of this tumor. Then we have the schwannoma, it's very common. So you, you, there's a, a capsulate behind soft tissue of the schwann cell. It can affect any, any motor sensory it's very more common than neurofibroma. It's usually symptomatic. You have you can have tinal uh, thing. Uh, yeah, and in some cases, you, you can see in the MRI, the nerve. This is very typical here. This is nerve. I'm going to show more images. And usually if it bothers, you can take it with the marginal intuitional. And it's very strange that uh, you have some problems with the nerve. 
you can see here, you just open the nerve and you can take it out. Here you can see the nerve in the MRI. It's not a big problem. But the difference is with the neurofibroma. The, the neurofibroma is multiple cell tissues. It's, it's not an all you, you can take about the nerve. You can see here, it's a, a different, the MRI, and you can have the plexiform neurofibroma uh, that is related to the neurofibromatosis. Uh, usually you don't take it because you can, you, you can have nerve deficit and it's related to the neurofibromatosis type one that is uh, autosomic dominant. And it's, uh, you have a high risk of transformation. You have to control and uh, you never know which one is going to be where we become malignant, but you have to control them. This is a, a very headache. The nodular facilities, you can perform, uh, this is self-limited reactive process. It can be taken for a fibrous neoplasm. You can see this picture. You, we, we take it, it, it's usually less than two centimeters. We take it with this muscle because the biopsy, sometimes the pathologist uh, uh, diagnosis a sarcoma. And, uh, but usually it's a benign. The only that I can let you know that it grows in, in one or two weeks. So you, 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 you became afraid of it's a malignant and it could be pain or, or tenderness, but it's usually less than two centimeters and you have to be marginal and traditional. Why you, you have this picture? We, because in the biopsy, there was suspicion of malignancy. So, so they usually uh, are, are tumors that you take because you think that it's malignant because it grows rapidly. But the only clue that I could uh, give to you that is usually less than two centimeters, but it's very difficult to diagnose. Then, you have the myxoma, you, you have a homogeneous tumor. Here is a benign non aggressive myxomatosis soft tissue tumor. O, usually, older patients, it's a painless mass. It's very common in the shoulder and upper arm, but it's more common in the lower limb. The MRI appearance is very homogeneous, so it's a typical of a benign tumor. And you, you just perform a, mar a margin excision, but usually, you perform a, a biopsy. Then it's the, the fibromatosis of the small plastic. You know, this, this is a really very bad tumor. It's like chewing gum. You can see here, it's a very, it's a very high risk of local recurrence. If you, if you remember the, the picture I show you, usually tumors grows and this, you, you know, the muscle are displaced, but here it grows and it's like chewing gum. It's a, it's a nerve is near, it's with the nerve, it's with, with the vessel, whatever. It's very difficult to treat them. Surgery, when possible, is a wide resection. Radiation, it's, you can give it for some cases if you don't have good margins. So we treatment like malignant tumors, but really it's a big problem. You can see these big masses we have to take with the scapula. It really, uh, it's very uncommon to have malignancy, but it's very difficult to manage. You can see this case with the fibromatosis there, the, the, the nerve is compromised here and it's very, you, you don't have any plan to, to make the sections there. And we have the elastofibroma, really it's a tumor-like reactive process. In some cases it says that it's like the friction between the scapula and the chest wall. Uh, older patients, usually symptomatic, there is a snapping in the, in the examination. It's very common to be bilateral. And usually we just make observation. Simple excision is great, but it's very, uh, it's, we, you, you lose a lot of blood in surgery. It doesn't make any sense to take it. You have to manage the patient that he knows that it's just, uh, it's just a bump there and nothing more. You can see here, we, we control with the CT scans and it's bilateral here, you can see the other one, but it's very common. It's very common in the clinic. Here you can see the lesion. You can see here the big one and here a small one. It's always under the, the scapula, so that's a snapping. Then the glomus tumor, usually hand surgeons see, see them more than us. It's a rare benign tumor. It's a normal glomus. It's in the fingers. It's very common as the region. 
this 20, 40 years in this margin incision, there's a, a global tumor in the upper, lower limb that in this, you can see it, that is intermediate, but it's mainly in the, in the, mus in the muscles of uh, near, near the femur or in other parts, but always the finger is benign tumor. Then we have the synovial chondromatosis. It's a, a metaplastic proliferation. It's very strange in, in, the, in the upper limb uh, because it usually sees in the, in the elbow, you can see the wrist on, on the shoulder. There's some limited range of motion like this patient, but you can see it mainly in shoulder and elbow, but it's more uncommon in the upper extremity. And you can see the nodules, at, uh, not at the beginning, but then you have you see this nodule, and you can take it arthroscopy or, or by a synovectomy. It, it's okay because it's very difficult to take this in the in the elbow. It's very strange. It's just to show you, it's a patient that you have erosion, so that is a signal of malignant. It's very common to have a chondral sarcoma, but you know, you can see the huge mass, but you 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 already see this erosion. And this is a very strange case, but it could perform a chondral sarcoma if you leave it alone. So you have to be aware of that. It's, it's usually performed uh, with the arthroscopy to take that nodules. The pigmented bilateral synovitis is uh, usually, uh, it used to be two tumors, the, the intraticular is a PBNS and the giant cell tumor of the tendon sheet was another tumor now. We know that it's the same tumor. Usually here in the in the upper limb, in the upper limb, you, you always see it like the extra articular. And it's a very tiny tumor near the tendon sheet. It's very common in the hand. And oh, usually there's a joint pain, swelling, effusion, and decreased range of motion. You can see nulls here, like this. This is all different cases. And it's always if it's intraticular, you can remove it, but usually in, in the chance of tumor of tension, you, you treat it with margin resection is very common. Now, now we know that it's the same tumor and we give it the same name. There are some treatments for the big ones, but for example, the, the PBNS intraticular, 80% are in the knee. It's very uncommon in the upper extremity. Mainly you, you hear in the upper extremity, you, you saw the giant cell tumor of tension. And the last one, it's the myositis ossificans. That it's a, it's not a tumor; it's a erratic process. And there, there's, it's usually a, a, there's some trauma, something that happens. You have to ask the patients uh, because there is some pain and swelling, and and there is a decreased range of motion. It usually have to be an injury, but some sometimes not, and, and you you can hit. All these pictures I want to show you, this was uh, was a central work clinic because of an osteosarcoma. Because at the beginning, at the beginning, the it it it's it's, it's mainly there's no classification, so they be, they they believe there's a malignant tumor of the soft tissue, and the biopsy you uh, it's very confusing with the osteosarcoma. So you can see here the bone here. And how, how you make diagnosis, you have to wait. And if you wait, you, you, you're going to find this, this calcification that the ossification is centripet. So it's beginning at, 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 in the upper, in the, yeah, in the outside to inside, you, you can see here this. So this is the X-ray and the X-ray when it, it, this girl came to the clinic and here you can see calcification. So sometimes, Although the patient is, have the study, you can ask a new study, it could change for two weeks. And in this case, uh, when they performed the biopsy, it was confused with the uh, uh, sarcoma of the soft tissue. The patient have a, a reactive uh, of the, uh, aller she, she was allergic and she, she, had, she had some nodules in the, in the, in, the, in the pulmonary CT. So it was sent to the clinic like a Sanova sarcoma with pulmonary meds, it, it was a myositis specifica. So you have to review the pathology. You have to ask for a new X-ray. With just the X-ray, this is not calcifications like the hemangioma, it's really a big mass. And then you, you, you can see here, you can take the mass. In this case, we take it because it was the, the forearm. So 
here it, there was a limitation of the mobility. So usually the mineralization begins three weeks. The, you can see here the remax shell. Uh, you, you need to wait for a while. Excision only if there are some limitations, but it's usually asymptomatic. This is our case. This case, the, the, you can see the open biopsy, and this is uh, myositis ossificant, and this was sent after two cycles of chemotherapy. So really this increase because what the biocity significant when we reviewed the pathology, it was a myocity significance. It's very common to confuse even for the for a pathology. So be aware of the MACITIS. You have to ask for a new X-ray and it could help. So in conclusion, I, I think it's you, you, it's quite long this, but the tumors in the upper extremity are less frequent than in the lower extremity. Patient's history is very important, such so change. The size of mass, night pains, of stress, trauma, trauma, mass significant, or trauma, very uh, not so big the trauma and has a fracture. The diagnosis imaging is crucial. Never forget the x-ray, it's very important for us. Soft tissue masses that are larger than five centimeters or deep, that in best fascia have a high increased chance of being a sarcoma and should be referred to an orthopedic oncology center before the biopsy, because sometimes the biopsy have to be performed in the center. And it's very important that the curing gradient station system for these tumors are designed to guide treatment. That's why I, I show you at the beginning. So that's all.